terrible. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Insane. I like your background. It's a beautiful sunset. Thank you. <laughs> I'm copying Regina's theme. She likes sets. She changes it depending on her mood. Oh, nice. <laughs> I need to get me some background. Um, yeah, you just, I just downloaded it from images on Google. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do that for the next meeting. <laughs> next. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> so how are the kids doing? They're doing well, waiting for school to be over, of oh, course. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, but they're doing well. Um, yeah, they're actually pretty good. I think I'm the only one getting like cabin fever. Oh, and, really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I need to get it. I was over at Richard's Garden the other day just to get oh. out. Uh -huh. We made sure we stayed six feet away, but I was over there. <laughs> well, you know what? Call me when you want to because my yard is huge. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And and um, you could definitely, we could be 20 feet away from each other <laughs> in my yard. <laughs> I'm going to come over. I am yeah, ready. yeah. Wear a mask. Richard was over here the other day, too. Oh, Do yeah. Wear a mask. And yeah. oh, that's fine. That awesome. Sense. Awesome. None of that. Oh man. Okay, let me tune that. Let me close my door. Tune day oh. loud. I know what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to stop the video when I left. We enjoyed the scenery on the instructional leadership vision. And um, also just kind of called out what's going on in the community at large. Mm -hmm. In the school community at large. Well, well I mean, it hits all our black and brown children, right? Oh, what's yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just emphasizing our our role in, and I'll share a little bit more about disrupting inequities and yeah. being able to promote social justice. Yeah. And we can't settle. Yeah. That's one of the things that I think about is um, I was just actually writing a piece because, um, you know, that officer, he, that mentality comes from someplace. And where was that cultivated that he could dehumanize a person to that level? You know, it's like that's something that was ingrained in him. And where did that come from? And so we as a country have to face that reality that those kinds of, um, those kinds of beliefs are real and they need to oh, be yeah. discussed, you know, so that we can resolve it because this is terrible, you know? <sighs> You know, that's why I, I told my son, I mean, honestly, when I became the mayor or when I got on the council, I made sure that every police officer and every chief knew who Allende was. It's like, okay, so this is my son. Know how he looks. Okay. So, yeah, because it used to frighten me, you know, especially if he went downtown Palo Alto. You know, it's like, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Cindy, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, if you look at his, um, his record and how much, um, how much violence and complaints he was involved in, like, I mean, that's, you know, even if he, even if on, on the best intentions, when he starts the profession, he doesn't have those kinds of attitudes. Like he continues to get away with right. that type of violence towards community. You know, you, you know, over and over again, you just think that like, oh, it, I can do this. Yeah. And hello, hello, everybody. Oh, hi, Anna. Hi. Do we have a quorum present? Uh, three of us are here. All right. Does anyone know if Tam or oh, here she oh, comes. Oh yeah, Tam is here. Yeah. No, did Maria Lena told you oh, she was did coming today? He did not right. inform me otherwise. The first ones that were like. All right. Okay, it's 6.32, so we're gonna get started. 
Um, I am opening the Ravenswood City School District Board of Trustees regular session of May 28th, 2020 at 6.32 p.m. Roll call, please. President Polito. Present. Vice President Wilson. Here. Trustee Fitch. Here. Trustee Diona. Trustee Shabal Mahim. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum present. So we will continue with our agenda. So approval of the agenda, are there any changes? Okay, great. If there are none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second. All right, so roll call. President Polito. Aye. President and Vice President Wilson. Aye. Trustee Fitch. Aye. Trustee Sobomahin. Aye. Okay, motion carries four to zero. So we are going to go into closed session, but before we do, uh, Trustee Fitch, are there any speakers? Or maybe Solomon, I should be asking. I'm not tag team. If there are any speakers, they need to make a comment in the chat box that they wish to speak on the closed session matters. I see none, Stephanie. I see none. All right. So then we will move into closed session. We will resume uh, to open session at approximately 7.15 p.m. Thank you.
Schatz, kurze Haare.
Solomon, there's a question in the chat. If there's an estimate of when they might be coming back. Thank you. 715 is what I've been told. I haven't heard anything else. Somebody asking me to unmute. Uh, Rhonda, you're raising your hand. Is that for um, open? That was I, that was earlier. Okay. Because I I couldn't get your attention and I yeah so sorry <laughs> sorry. Okay. I'm good. You Cindy jumped on and helped me, so I got my answer. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I already missed from the floor. Correct. Um, no, just uh, before closed session. Closed session items, yes, but not open session. Okay. Thank you have an opportunity do you want do you think you'll want to speak then nope i think the item i want to talk to is is listed and i'll let you know if i would like to speak to it okay great thank you thank you okay sorry
Eric Granados, I just uh, sent you a message in the chat if you can uh, reply to me.
think everybody's back. Okay, is Trustee Owen on? Yes, she thinks she is. Okay. All right, so we are returning to open session at 7.16 p.m. There were no changes to the agenda. Trustee Gohanam and those side joined us during closed session at approximately um, 6.35 p.m. So there was no action taken during closed session as stated on the agenda. Only discussion was held for items 3A, one and 3A2 and a report was given on 3B. So we will move on to the next part of our agenda. And we will start off with the approval of minutes. So 5A consideration to approve the minutes of May 14th. Are there any questions or comments? If there are none, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make, I'll make a, mo a motion that we approve of the minutes of May 14th. I'll second. Roll call, please. President Polito. Aye. Vice President Fitch. Aye. I'm sorry, Vice President Wilson. I'm looking at Stephanie. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Trustee Fitch. Aye. Trustee Diana. You're, oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. Aye. Trustee Shabomahin. Aye. All right, motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Let's move on to item six from the floor. So welcome to the public, whoever is tuning in tonight to participate and listen in on our meeting. Uh, this is the portion of the meeting where anyone can speak on any topic that's not agendized. If it's already agendized, we ask that you wait for the item before you submit or we don't have a card but, uh, before you ask to speak. So if are there any speakers from the floor? I don't see any in the chat. Okay. No one's raising their hand. Alrighty. And yes, for those oh, that wait, there is a speaker. Okay. So just to know you have two minutes to speak and Trustee Fitch will be tracking the time and we are not able to act on anything that is not agendized. So we are more of a listening body during this time. Uh, Diana Krippendorf. Oh. Was mine, is, is the reading on um, the agenda? Is it now a good time to talk about reading? It's agendized today. So we would ask that you speak uh, when the item comes up, which is item, let's see. Nine A, if you can wait for item nine A, we're gonna have a report on literacy intervention. Okay, and then I can speak then too? I can speak then? Yes, if you can speak then, yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so if there's no speakers on any topic not agendized, then we will move on to the consent agenda. So the board approves a consent agenda in one motion and the board has the opportunity to remove any item from the consent agenda and no one removed any items. So I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. All in favor? I mean, roll call, please. President Polito. Aye. Vice President Wilson. Oh, you muted. Yes. Trustee Fitch. Yes. Trustee Guyona. Yes. Trustee Shabomahin. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. That will take us to item 8A, the superintendent's report. Great. Solomon will share for us. We are going to address the COVID-19 update, but um, on the next slide, I thought we would address as a board just what is going on in today's society that's been going on for some time. 
And as educators, we are privileged to be in a position to disrupt the inequities and to ensure that social justice prevails. Um, what is happening to our black and brown, to black and brown communities is atrocious. And as educators, as leaders, as elected officials, I feel very privileged to be in this position and to work alongside you women of color to be able to make a difference here in East Palo Alto. I believe that we all possess the skills and abilities to be able to advocate, to be able to insist, to demand what not only our community deserves, but more importantly, the children of Ravenswood City School District. And earlier today, I spoke with our instructional leadership team about the expectation and what I, in a sense, which I typically don't say, is demand our staff to not settle for anything less when they step in front of students. The next slide, Solomon. We must ensure that we care about our kids. We truly must empathize with our families and our children. And we must have the tenacity to persevere. It is very challenging. The work that we do every day is very challenging. But any person who works for Ravenswood must empathize and have the tenacity to do what's right for Ravenswood City School District. And I cannot express enough. More importantly, I guess I'm confessing here is I feel like I could have done so much more and so many, and there were so many opportunities. And I think here now, we just need to take a stand and not settle. Our vision that we created together, the board, you led us to a strategic plan and we de developed our vision and our mission. And on the next slide, it truly embodies the work that we are going to do. And that is every student, we empower every student to fully engage critically and creatively in their education with the skills and mindsets necessary to successfully fulfill their unique potential. We can go through our core values as well, but the bottom line here is we have to tackle this and we have to live by our mission every single second. Our children, our black and brown children's lives are at risk. It is very evident. And I know working alongside you and how you advocate on a bi-monthly basis at board meetings, but more importantly, in your walk every single day, that our community should not have any wiggle room about what we're gonna stand for. And I would like for you to hold me accountable for that as well. That leads us into our COVID-19 update. It seems trivial compared to the loss of some of our black and brown students, but people are dying over this as well. And we want to ensure that um, our children are safe, our staff are safe when we think about our next steps. The next slide, please, Solomon. So I would like to just first thank everyone for their patience and their perseverance because We've been in shelter in place and doing distance learning for two months now, and the days seem to merge together at this point. And, and believe it or not, we're already nearing the end of the 1920 academic school year. And it seems like we're just getting a grip on distance learning um, and understanding how best to support and serve students while also just uncovering where we still need to provide and, and support and where the needs persist. The next slide are some dates here. So teachers will continue to provide instruction through Wednesday, June 3rd. They will then work diligently to complete cumulative folders and report cards on June 4th and 5th in preparation for parent guardian communication. So starting Monday, June 8th through Wednesday, June 10th, teachers will reach out to families via phone 
or Zoom, that's, that's our goal, and include information for parent guardians on their student engagement and the progress during distance learning, as well as the opportunities that we're gonna offer during the summer. Promotion activities will also take place during um, these last three days of school, June 8th through the June, through June 10th. During the summer, and we'll talk a little bit more about what's being offered from the Boys and Girls Club, um, but we will have a couple of summer programs and then blended learning programs available to families. So we'll share a little bit more um, under CNI when we talk about the Boys and Girls Club summer program. But also as a reminder, the board did approve our MOU with Jose, Math, Jose Valdez Math Institute. We're third through seventh grade students. We have 300 slots for students to participate in math instruction virtually over the summer. And then these are blended learning programs that we've had throughout the year, except for Seesaw. We just, um, we, we, we got that program um, when we started distance learning. And you can see the various computer adaptive programs that students will be able to utilize um, on their devices if they are participating in summer program or also devices that they have at home. Kidapolis is also another program that we want to encourage families to dive into and take a look at. It kind of assess students' performance and then suggest learning apps for parents to use on their phone for kids. And it gives them a report on how students are progressing. We can go on to the next slide. Um, while we move into the summer, services will, these resources will be able, we will be able to continue with the food distribution. So Ravenswood curbside and delivery will for sure go through June 30th. We're confirming that we will be able to provide seamless, seamless meals through the end of July and, and information will be forthcoming about that. So any child 18 or younger will be able to get food um, through the Ravenswood City School District's Child Nutrition Education. Second Harvest will continue as well on Saturdays. They also still provide food um, at the Ravenswood Middle School, first come, first serve between 10 and one o'clock on a daily basis. We also um, would like to make note that those families who qualify for free and reduced meals, CalFresh, Medi-Cal or foster care benefits are able to um, apply for a pandemic EBT card and they're eligible for a one-time payment of $365 per child. If anybody in the community needs assistance, our registrar has also been very helpful in helping families receive these pandemic EBT cards. We'll also be able to continue with social emotional support. Star Vista will be able to still manage cases. And then, Children's Health Council and Child Mind Institute families can contact them directly to receive support during the summer. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So although summer is right around the corner, the Board of Trustees and staff will continue innovating how we will have school and bring an effective, engaging and rigorous instructional program to our grade TK-8 students for the 2021 school year. Uh, we will take heed and work within the parameters of the San Mateo County Health officials and follow orders as we move gingerly through the phases to reopen. The first task for each district in San Mateo County is to create a task force to research, discuss and develop recommendations for our, our districts, return to school plan, um, and the Ravenswood administration and union president have already come together to kind of strategize and we've looked at current health orders, we've looked at and identified other plans that other districts have um, shared. We know that additional participants must be invited, so we wanna ensure to include families and community partners. And I know the board will have uh, conversations later on this evening to identify board members who will participate on the reopen task force. Go ahead and turn to the next slide. So the County Office of Education does have a framework that's an internal document. They are going to be able to provide an executive summary early next week that will be in multiple languages to give a background to the entire community about what districts are going to have to um, 
take into consideration the guidelines, the health orders. Um, and they'll also help by also promoting through their own social media to try to get the word out about what we are as a district or districts in the county are going to be working on. When we consider looking at the reopening of schools, not only do we wanna make sure schooling is valuable, meaningful, and students remain engaged, but we also have to ensure the safety of students, staff, and family. And there are gonna be four pillars that we're going to have to take into consideration and look at very closely. Um, that's going to force us to really look at how we create school. So the health and hygiene, and we'll be at, on this slide for a minute, Solomon. When you look at the health and hygiene, some of the protocols that we're gonna to have to put in place is of course, put the signs, um, consider maybe having hand wash stations, not only in the bathrooms, but in the outside areas, in the hallways. Um, and little things like providing incentives, um, encouraging and having videos. The county office is actually going to help by creating videos on how to best wash hands and um, follow these protocols. We're going to have to look at temperature taking and use the touchless thermometers and measure the temperature of students as they come to school. And we're gonna to have to make sure that we have the essential protective equipment. We are already working um, with the county, our maintenance operations, transportation coordinator, student services director, our HR director are already working closely to make sure that we have the necessary supplies um, by time fall comes around. So, in addition to that, we have to make sure that our cleaning is up to par. Mm -hmm. And depending on the frequency of or what our model is going to look like, depend will 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 dictate what our cleaning schedule is going to have to be. Uh, when you look at face coverings, you know, of course, we're going to want to have. I mean, just think about our TK kindergarten students coming to school with face masks and trying to get to know their teacher, an adult that they've never been to school before and trying to you know, have a, build a relationship behind a mask. And psychologists say, you know, kids are resilient and they, they only know what they know and what are, they're exposed to, but it's still gonna be challenging times. And so we're gonna have to think about wearing face masks while outside the classroom. If they're in the classroom, there's some leniency about whether or not students can keep their, their face masks on. Um, there's certain students where that's going to be very difficult to do because they have special and unique needs. So there's a framework for us to practice um, and follow protocols in terms of when and who, where we have these face masks. And then in terms of physical distancing, there's two different types of cohorts. You have the bubble cohort and you have a stable cohort. The bubble cohort is what we're really familiar with right now, and that's um, the child care protocols um, where there's about 12 students with one adult and they are located and they stay in one location and they don't mix at all. Whereas a stable cohort is that you do have a defined group of students and you, I mean, you, there, there is some ability to implement physical distancing. Um, you do have more than one teacher during the instructional day uh, and through a assigned, and they are assigned a particular area in the campus and they go from those areas to be able to have the, the courses. So um, the high school is very much impacted and are looking more at the stable cohort than they are the bubble cohort because the bubble cohort is ideal in general and is more applicable for early childhood and students with um, special and unique needs. Um, but it's not ideal for, and nor is it really practical in reality, especially when you look at a high school. Uh, I'm proud to be able to work with some innovative leaders in the county and we will be participating in meetings to be able to brainstorm about how middle school for us, which was more applicable to high school, 
um, than it is for the elementary because we do have multiple classes and students typically see multiple teachers at the middle school level. And then we have to look at limiting gathering and what is required activity and what is non-required activity similar to at the start of this whole pandemic when we first were thinking about it's gonna go from 200 people in a gathering to 50 people to 10 people to no gatherings whatsoever. And so we're going to have to follow protocols once those are finalized as well around um, gathering and assemblies and different events that take place. On the final slide is that there's gonna be a scope of contingency plans. We can't just start in the fall hoping that this is what it's gonna be because it's going to be changing. Uh, we're gonna be keeping our ear to the ground throughout the entire summer, planning throughout the entire summer. And we can plan for three different models with variants in between. One of them is, you know, you wanna hope for the best. We're all gonna be back on August 26th when school starts, full swing of things as if nothing happened. That is not ideal. And so we wanna hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And a worse is having to do distance learning at the start of school. And then we wanna eventually move into having some form of a model where you have a staggered start time and you have different cohorts coming in either in the morning, in the afternoon, two days out of the week, and the other cohort comes in the other two days of the week. One cohort comes in the morning, one cohort comes in the afternoon. This is what the reopen school task force is going to be tasked with, is working out these different contingency plans with the framework and the different protocols that are gonna to have to be followed. And with the final slide, any questions? Thank you. I don't think I have the answer. <laughs> I don't think anyone has the answer yet. <laughs> All right, so any questions or comments from the board regarding this report? Um, I just have two questions. One, are we surveying the parents about how they feel about di the different scenarios? And if so, did it already go out? Will it be going out? No, there's actually a couple of districts who have sent out surveys and several districts have thanked them for drafting those surveys. We are actually um, looking into MA survey that just went out and Menlo Park um, also sent out a survey. So we're blending those two so that it would be appropriate fit for our community. Okay, so we and that will be going out before the end of the school year. Okay, great. I would just love to see how parents are feeling about sending their kids back and the different scenarios that we're looking at and how, you know, we can expect students to come or not come, but we won't know until we kind of try to gauge how parents are feeling. So that was um, one of my questions and the other question was, I know San Mateo County Health Department issued a lot of what they called, I think, guardrails. Was that what you were talking about as far as like the orders? Did you get that list of information of how they're anticipating um, the rollout of schools happening? Were you privy to that? In regards to guardrails, I don't, I'm. You know what they're calling them guardrails, but basically what they're referring to is the San Mateo Health Department has issued, like you can reopen, for schools and you mentioned that, you know, you're gonna be in contact with them, but they've already released a long extensive list under how you can reopen and the framework within you can reopen. When you mentioned working with Cemetery Health Department, is that, was that, did you receive that information already as you're working with the task force? Right, so there is a framework, an internal document that we have and the health officer is still reviewing that before it becomes official. Okay. Um, but we do have some tools to already start planning and discussing when we meet with our task force. Yes. And will we be able to have uh, an update of the task force at our next meeting? I'll be happy to, yes. We'll be able to share who is on the task force. 
Yeah, just share who's on the task force. What are the questions you're tackling? What kind of, if you have been able to create any kind of consensus on any of these scenarios? Yeah. Um, I would just kind of like to be, I don't want to wait till the end of it. I'd like to kind of follow along as it goes, just to get initial reactions and feedback from the board as, as it develops. Absolutely. Yep. So yes. Also, I have a comment. I would like to make sure that we do have a uh, parents representation and teachers, special ed teachers, special ed parents, because it's very important to have, you know, everybody uh, representing the students. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. I believe those are all the questions we have for right now, Gina. Okay. So let's move on. Do you have another report? Um, um, yes, thank you. We have the middle school design task force presentation and our architect, Chris Bradley, and our project manager, Noreen Bruno, will be sharing, um, will be presenting and sharing out um, the outcomes from our design task force meeting. Well, great, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. And can you see my screen? Not yet. Oh. How's that? There we are. All right. Well, good evening. It's uh, great to be back in front of you again, uh, if only virtually. We're gonna be talking about the Ravenswood Middle School Phase Two project. And we've been busy working on that the last few months, uh, namely developing the, the project scope and uh, really the, the sort of broad brushstroke approach to the project with the district's um, middle school design task force. And that was formed by the district to provide guidance and stakeholder input into the project and, and really build consensus around what we're doing. And the, the meetings we've had thus far have really proven to be very effective in that. In fact, I think we've gone through uh, about seven or eight schemes that have varied widely in exploring the, the possible um, solutions um, to the campus as part of the design process. And so that's been going great. Uh, the design task force includes district principals, teachers, the superintendent, uh, a number of members of cabinets, uh, cabinet, uh, parents, and student representatives. And with them, we've developed the project scope, which we'll get into in just a minute. We reviewed the site program, which is basically all the uses of spaces on the site and what is needed to operate all the different programs and classrooms that the, the school runs. And then from that develop the project program, which will be the things that we're specifically working on as part of this project. Uh, the phase two scope was ultimately developed with feedback and, and just a ton of input with uh, the design task force. And through that process, there was an emphasis developed on building new classrooms on campus security and really two different senses of security, uh, securing the site after hours and preventing vandalism, and then also being able to secure the campus during the school day. And there's there's sort of two different fence lines, if you will, that we're developing to, to make that happen. We'll get into that just a little bit more in a, in a few slides. Uh, developing a new campus identity and what we're calling kind of the front door so that when you arrive at campus, you know exactly where the office is there's a clear delineation of where a visitor is supposed to go. And there's a controlled entry into the site as well as uh, really refreshing the experience coming onto the site and, and giving it a, a proper and, and new uh, architectural experience. And then also providing sufficient and appropriate spaces for student services. Uh, providing air conditioning and heating upgrades to the existing classrooms, as well as some additional uh, improvements that we'll talk about in just a bit. And then also the, the team wanted to minimize campus sprawl. And by that, uh, as you probably well know, it's a very large campus. And uh, looking at some of the different places to put a, a new building, it's begun to create quite a distance from one end of campus to the other with the, the plausible outcome of having 
um, much longer passing periods or needing longer passing periods. And so one of the guidance components was to minimize that so that we really have a, a centralized, focused and well-functioning campus. And then keeping the soccer fields and track at Bay Avenue. Uh, we did look at some schemes that put buildings out towards uh, Bay Avenue and um, that's one that we've moved away from. And then lastly, minimizing interim housing needed during construction and looking at a way to not spend the district's bond dollars on temporary housing during construction, but really keeping as much as possible into actual built construction that will be there once the project's done. And then the project scope was developed with the, these in mind. Here's an aerial photograph of the campus for reference. Um, Ralmar Avenue, which is the entry into the campus is there on the left and then Bay Road uh, down at the bottom. We've been using the traditional building designations throughout the, the previous project and this one. And so just for reference here, um, let's see if you can see my laser pointer, virtual laser pointer. Uh, this is building A here, which is the, where we did work um, last summer to developing the new science labs, the flex rooms and the classrooms. Uh, building B is just in front of it, adjacent to the parking lot there. Uh, building F has the, the music room, the library, multi-purpose and the gym. And then wings C, D and E behind that, as well as your portables here in the corner and then also here next to the track. We're gonna be zooming into this part of the campus to talk about the projects. Now, what I've got on screen right now is phase one. This is the one we did last summer and shows the work we did at buildings A and F. Uh, we will not be doing any additional work at those uh, buildings right now um, with the, the idea that the scope has really been done at those buildings and we'll be focusing on other permanent buildings as well as new construction moving forward. The first component of the phase two um, conceptual project scope would be a new building. And we're looking at doing a new two-story classroom building in the parking lot. And doing that both because it's a very logical, centralized location for new classrooms. It helps minimize that campus sprawl that I was just talking about. And it allows us to use the parking lot, which is frankly oversized, uh, to do construction and not need to do interim housing. And so we're proposing to do a new two-story classroom building there uh, highlighted in purple with the number one. In addition to that, we're proposing to build a new student services and admin building where the three portables are underneath the number two up here. And the reason being that right now you have your student services and administrative functions spread out a bit across campus and there's no clear front door uh, to essentially control traffic into the campus um, once the, the school day is started. And so that allows us to do that. It allows us to create a very clear entry into the site and to make significant improvements to campus security. And with that, we're proposing to create a new interior fence line. You'll still have your existing fence line around the campus. This would be a means of securing the campus during school so that once the kids are into school, gates are locked and the only way into campus is through the administration building where there's a controlled entry. And so we would be putting fencing here between the new two buildings, uh, two new buildings and then closing off here and tying it back into the main campus fencing. The next component would be a, what I'm calling a light modernization of the existing buildings shown here in orange. So these four wings here, uh, B, C, D, and K. And the proposed modernization scope in the classrooms will be new mechanical units with air conditioning. So you have both brand new heating and perhaps more importantly, cooling, uh, doing ADA upgrades to those classrooms, replacing the flooring, uh, repainting the interior and replacing the casework. And so this really would be a kind of touching everything in the classroom and, and making it look um, like a new classroom. And then also we would be doing selective ADA restroom upgrades across the campus in conjunction with the modernization. And then we would also be reconfiguring your parking and drop-off to create a more efficient 
flow in and out of the campus and to complement the new secured fencing. And so that's shown there in gray with the number five. And then we would also be proposing to demolish some to be determined quantity of classrooms, likely this wing here in the back. Uh, with new classrooms here, we can replace these or essentially, and then some group of portables as well to create some additional open space here. And this was chosen both because it's the furthest wing away from the center of campus and it's the, the wing also that seems to be in the worst shape and perhaps has the worst configuration for the way that it's going to be used moving forward. Uh, not shown on this slide, but additional scope that we're developing with whatever funds are remaining once we've done the cost estimating on what's shown on the screen would be additional um, site development and site improvements to the hardscape, which is another one of your needs and something that has come up uh, quite a bit in the, in the task force. And on the next slide, we've done a quick um, concept study for what the site might look like in three dimensions. And here you can see uh, this is building A, which is the one we did last summer, along with building F, which is the uh, library, music, and multipurpose and gym. This is a study for massing of what that two-story classroom building might look like, as well as the administration building here. And then these would be wings C and D, and then this is B and K. So this is just a very early uh, conceptual study um, as part of the design process, uh, but probably pretty similar to what we'd ultimately be um, developing. And then next steps, um, we'll be working with the district, the facility subcommittee and uh, construction manager to do a final uh, project schedule and get that approved. Then we'll be moving on to schematic design, which is that next step in the design development process. So we'll be going from uh, sort of that massing where we are now to really diving into floor plans and elevations and roof plans. And then from that, we'll be doing a cost estimate and scope verification. This will be making sure that we planned it properly with the funds available, uh, taking into account some of the very dynamic um, costs of construction right now, going especially with respect to some of the economic uncertainties and, and COVID-19 related um, changes to the cost of construction. And then also we're gonna be exploring additional funding sources for possible additional scope. And so this is um, a potential opportunity to find additional funds to do work. And we'll be uh, coming back to the board um, with hopefully some, some suggestions for uh, potential additional funding. And that's what we'll be doing in the future. And with that, are there any questions? Thank you, Chris, for that report and update. Um, as everyone knows, Trustee Wilson and myself are on that committee, so um, we've had a chance to see this. Uh, but I know to most of you, this is pretty new. So I will open it up for any board member question or comments. Uh, through the chair? Yes. I'm sorry if I missed this. Um, the time frame on the next phase of construction, Chris, and thank you so much for this presentation and uh, board trustees who are on this committee. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the time frame for this next phase of construction? Sorry if I missed it. Uh, you didn't miss it. Um, we are actually working on this project schedule right now with the district and with Teleku, the construction manager, and we're going to be presenting. Uh, that for approval with the stake or the facility stakeholder meeting on Tuesday. So we'll be coming back to the board with an approved schedule uh, to present. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? To the chair, I want to say one more thing because I did say thank you, but I didn't say that it looks amazing. Oh. Um, <laughs> It's, I'm excited about, about it. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's a trip to actually see this, like, I'm sure it's a trip to you guys who've been working on it much longer, but I mean, I, it's exciting. So great, great work. Thank you. We're certainly excited about it as well. 
Yes, this has been a long time planning. So we are definitely excited to get to the next steps just because the sooner we start the project, the sooner the kids can be in the classroom and enjoy an upgraded facility that will be appropriate for a middle school. All right, if there are there any speakers from the floor, Trustee Fitch? Uh, no one has mentioned in the comments that they wish to speak. Okay, all right. In that case, we will proceed with the agenda. And that leaves us to item 9A, the report on literacy intervention. And I know we will have a speaker at some point. So I believe this is Laura or Lada. Good evening, members of the board. Um, I'm Lara Burenin, um, Director of Curriculum and Instruction, and I'll be presenting on literacy intervention this evening, along with Eric Edwards, Data and Assessment Coordinator, and Jennifer Gravam, Special Education Director. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'm going to share my screen um, so that I can share the slides. We can see it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so let's move some stuff around. Okay, so we wanted to start off sharing a little bit about the literacy intervention resources we've had this year and then share more about what we'll be doing moving forward. When we talk about intervention in the district, it's really important to consider a tiered model. So with the multi-tiered system of support, um, we need to consider um, tier one, which is our research-based core instruction, which is universal for all students. Tier two, which is targeted intervention and tier three, which is intensive intervention. Um, and under a, a, an MTSS system, um, this, these tiers actually apply both for academics and for um, social emotional skills. Um, today we'll be focusing on academics and specifically literacy. So this year we've had two sources of literacy intervention, including um, reading recovery, which we've had in the district for many years and um, intervention provided by our literacy coach slash reading specialists. Um, Reading recovery is a tier three intensive intervention. So if you look at the triangle with three tiers, you can see that at the top, once students have gone through tier one and then tier two targeted intervention, the idea is that then we're referring students to a more intensive intervention. So it's often um, more intensive in, um, in frequency, so more often, um, it could be more specialized in terms of the size of the group. Um, and so reading recovery is both of those things. Um, the full reading recovery program is um, national or even internationally known for being a research-based program. And um, students are seen one-on-one -on -one every day for um, a literacy lesson targeted to their level um, for 20 weeks. So that's considered the full cycle. So our teachers this year worked with two first graders at a time. And then they also worked with five um, small groups, which can vary in size and levels, uh, mostly in first and second grade. And the cycles for those varied as well, approximately eight to 12 weeks per cycle. And as we've mentioned in the past, the funding for this position has been provided for, um, for a very long time by Tasha Morgridge and her husband, John Morgridge through their TOSA Foundation. And the other resource that we've had this year is um, our literacy coach reading specialist role. And this role um, supports multiple tiers actually. So there's a huge support around tier one where the coaches are coaching teachers in their classroom instruction. So working with them both in like a collaborative or team setting and also to provide one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching to support teachers to reflect on instruction and improve their practices for um, student outcomes. 
And then the coaches also provide tier two intervention by working with small groups, um, about three to four small groups per, for each coach um, with a range of grade levels um, across K-5. And uh, again, approximately eight to 12 weeks per cycle. And our coaches use the Level Lit Literacy Intervention Program from Fountas and Pinnell, which is an intervention curriculum, um, which aligns with our balanced literacy model. And our coaches are also um, important leaders on campus. So one example of that is that they um, serve as teacher in charge when the principal is not on campus. As you know, we don't have vice principals um, at our elementary schools this year. So um, it's really important to have that distributed leadership and support for the principal and for the school site. And our literacy coach reading specialist positions are funded 80% by um, the Ravenswood Education Foundation and 20% um, by Title I because they provide direct service to students, um, which is supplemental to core instruction. And that's the intention of Title I funding. So um, Eric will share a little bit about um, an overview of some of our intervention data from those two um, resources. And then we'll talk more about um, how our intervention will look moving forward and how we're thinking about that tiered model. Oops. Thank you, Laura. Yes, as you said, these data will give us an overview, a picture of our student outcomes for these different interventions. Should I see please when we're ready to go to the next slide? Uh, reading recovery for 1920. Students that are selected for the intervention of reading recovery are chosen because those are the students that are struggling the most in reading. Here's what we have for 1920. Although I should say the record keeping was not always consistent and there may have been people, students who received services that I was not able to find. We had four reading recovery teachers in 1920, 13 students participating in the program. Some of them came into first grade at pre-A, which is our lowest reading level. Six out of the 13 were pre-A. If you count all of the first graders of the 158, 76 of those were pre-A, please. You may be used to these, you may not be. We have been reporting growth as a unit of a year. Uh, in this case, it's BOY to MOY. So the decimal value uh, shows what we would expect them. We would expect 0.5 of a year, 5 tenths of a year and this is what we were able to show for their growth. For example, first graders with no intervention grew seven tenths of a year. Uh, although first graders often do well and grow fast, especially considering they may have fallen behind over the summer and are able to regroup and recap the losses that they've done quickly. Students receiving reading intervention grew at one year at the half year grade point Growth for first graders not receiving intervention with BOA of pre-A grew at half a year at year's midpoint. And growth for first graders in reading recovery with a BOY of pre-A grew at nine tenths of a year at the mid-year point. Thank you. I'm gonna switch to thank you instead of please. Now, let's compare historically to another year to try to get a picture of the program as it has been for the last several years. In the year 1718, which also we measured BOY to MOY to compare easily, there were 12 reading recovery teachers. The number of students receiving one-on-one -on -one intervention was 125. The students receiving small group, 89. To compare growth for students who didn't receive any intervention, was 44% of a year, just under half of a year at the halfway point. Growth for reading recovery students in the first grade, which I think is, is an almost entirely one-on-one, -on -one, although I think some of the first graders also were in small group, 72% of a year. And growth for reading recovery second graders, 64% of a year. Here is the rub. The headline growth is great, but it hides variance in outcome. Thank you. Oh, please, which is better? If we show growth amongst all of the different reading recovery 
providers across the district at that time, the variation in outcomes between the providers at different schools made it impossible to show that the program as a whole was consistently effective uh, as a complete adherent program. And this pattern we have seen consistently in previous years. Thank you. So, yeah. Do you want the questions now or do you want the questions later? Up to you, ma'am, I go either way. Sharifa, could we, um, could we wait till the end just in case okay. he answers it along the way? Okay. Okay. Take me, I'm sorry, can you take me back one slide so I can get the name of that slide? Yeah, okay, 17, 18. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So here's the, another intervention that was provided this year. Literacy coaches did small group interventions during this, the 1920 year, also showing beginning of year to mid year. There were eight coaches, 192 students received that literacy coaches intervention. If we compare growth for students receiving no intervention was 40% of a year, four tenths of a year. Growth for students receiving literacy intervention from the literacy coaches was seven tenths of a year. And if we compare again to those target students of pre-A, students reading at the pre-A level at BOA in the literacy coach intervention grew at one and four tenths of a year. There you go. So to compare, if we measure the variation between literacy coaches, at least for this year, I think it's our only year, it's a fairly even variation. There are no large differences or discrepancies in outcome. Thank you. Uh, that, that was the end of my part. Um, did we wanna take questions about data at this point or should we keep going? If it's about data, yes, please. Uh, questions about the data. Uh, Trustee Wilson, did you still have your question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Can you go back to slide nine, please? Sure. Mm. I just want to understand what it actually says. So, this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so does this mean RR1 reading? Is this, um, I, I'm sorry. Is this identified by the teacher? No, uh, it's been anonymized and that's why it goes like one, two, three, four. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. So, because when you talk about different providers, I mean, okay, never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you that offline. Okay, but maybe I'll just say the, the big idea here is if you don't have consistency within your system, well, then you don't have a system. And it, we were unable to implement consistently, which I think has been the frustration over the years. Okay. Okay, any other questions? You can go ahead. Okay, so as we go into next year, um, as we mentioned, we will no longer have the funding from the TOSA Foundation for the reading recovery position. Um, we will have continued funding from the Ravenswood Education Foundation for the literacy coach um, uh, reading specialist position. And as we um, merge our sites and change the configuration, we'll have three coaches at each of our larger elementary school sites. And we'll have two coaches at um, Los Robles Ronald McNair, um, which is really exciting because we had an opening there this year and we weren't able to fill it um, because of needing a, a bilingual candidate. Um, and those can be hard to find even for the classroom positions. So with our tiered intervention model moving forward, we want to be really thoughtful about giving students the highest possible quality experience in tier one um, and then, of course, targeting those interventions based on data in Tier 2 and then moving into Tier 3. So um, here's an overview of some of the things that we're planning. I do want to give a big caveat that um, I'm going to move, move forward and explain these, these ideas to you, but I, I do want to say that we don't know exactly what intervention will look like given the constraints of our health order. Um, and so as we figure out what school itself will look like, then um, providing intervention 
um, et cetera, will be part of that puzzle. Um, but these are sort of like the headline ideas that we want you to know. So for tiered literacy resources for K-5, if we start in tier one at the bottom, that's the base of the pyramid that all students receive. So our um, district approach is the, through balanced literacy instruction, which includes our adopted curriculum, the units of study for reading and writing, um, and also includes phonics in K through two. The um, tier one instruction provides students access to grade level text and to grade level standards. Um, and also includes differentiation. So it's, it's expected that through balanced literacy practices, teachers are able to address the different levels of students um, because we know that any class coming in will always have students at different levels. And it's our responsibility as educators to identify what those different needs are and figure out how to meet them. And so uh, a huge support in tier one is coaching and PD provided to support teachers in doing that because it is fairly complex. Um, and that's part of our job as educators in, in Ravenswood. And then moving into tier two, as teachers identify through their regular groups or one-on-one -on -one conferences um, and their data, students who are um, below the expectations for that time of the year, then the classroom teacher is part of providing tier two. So they might say, um, I'm not gonna meet with every group once a week because it's not a one size fits all approach. I might take my students who are at a certain level approaching grade level or approaching where they should be at this time of year. And I might see them twice a week. And then I might take students who are in the band um, lower than those students and I might see them three times a week. And working out the intricacies of identifying that data, making that schedule and using our curriculum resources um, is definitely a demanding job. And so again, our literacy coaches are a great support for teachers to work on that type of instruction. Um, one example this year is two of our coaches facilitated a reading intervention um, after school PD course. Um, so it was eight sessions and teachers were able to learn about um, more in depth guided reading, small group instruction strategies and, um, and receive coaching in those as well. And then another tier two intervention that we have is looking at that whole school data and identifying which students need more support our literacy coach slash reading specialist can provide small group instruction um, with the level literacy intervention program that I mentioned before. And this is in addition to their in-class instruction. Um, that part's really important because that's what makes it truly an intervention. Um, and then we might have students who are, we will have students who then need further support. And um, certainly when students have been through documented interventions and they're not showing the growth that we want to see, then um, it may be the case that the students through the SST process would be referred for assessment um, by special education. And if the assessments indicate that the student needs an IEP, then the IEP will show what services the student should receive. So that's considered tier three. It's highly specialized for what the student needs. And then a new resource um, we're adding next year that Jennifer Gravam has presented about and we'll say more about is the Sunday system, which is a curriculum for Orton Gillingham small group instruction specifically for students with dyslexia. And this curriculum um, comes with a screener. So we're able to identify who are the students who need this type of intervention. In any of the small groups we talk about, it's definitely our goal to make that instruction as targeted as possible because that's what's going to serve students best. Some of our key tier one strategies in K-5 um, are around data. So I've mentioned using data several times. One of the main data sources we use that we've talked about a lot before is the Fountas and Pinnell reading level assessment. And that tells you a student's reading level. Um, and then we have targets for where we, we want students to be at each grade level, which is based on um, correlations to the common core standards. Um, however, we want to support teachers to learn about and use a variety of data sources, um, including ongoing running records, writing samples, oral, oral language records, um, just to name a few. It's really important for us as a team, um, so both intervention teachers and classroom teachers, to be tracking data over time and revisiting after each cycle. And then our coaches are also really committed to having ongoing data meetings in our grade level collaboration structure so that looking at data is a shared venture. We, our interventionists and our classroom teachers are working with the same students and we really want that shared ownership of student progress and shared um, celebration. And then coaching is also a really key tier one strategy. 
through our student data, and that for, such as CASP, for example, and including reading levels, we know that our student achievement is not where we want it to be. And tier one is a big focus of our strategic plan. Um, and so that is a huge reason of why this role is so important to provide that coaching and support to teachers. Um, and as I mentioned, it can be around tier one and then also supporting teachers with thinking about in class tier two. Um, I've talked a lot about tier two, so then skipping over to tier three, um, Jennifer can share more. Thank you, Laura. Um, tier three interventions by nature are very individualized and special education is a very individualized department for looking at how our students learn and how they grow. Students are assessed for special education through standardized assessments that really help us determine exactly what area our students need help in and we provide those individualized supports. So going into next year, um, all of our school sites will have a room or two dedicated to our special education teachers and staff to be able to pull students out in a small group if they need a quieter learning environment so they can focus on their learning. Um, that, those groups could be made up of only students with special needs, but they could also be made up of students with special needs and students who are general education students who we've identified through the screener need that extra intervention. And we'll be using the Sande system as well as math differentiated instructional groups. You may be thinking math and literacy and wondering why I've included that. But one of the things for our students with special needs is they have so much trouble deconstructing math um, word problems and so that's huge for our students with special needs and that is a component of literacy it's mathematical literacy um, we we could also build uh, pull together groups based on social skills need or behavioral need or life skills that do often dovetail with literacy needs our speech and language specialists also have a separate area to pull students out or to push into the classroom if needed. And they work on things like receptive, expressive language or articulation goals that dovetail also with our students' literacy needs. So those are some tier three supports that special education um, offers. Um, Laura, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, Thank you, Jennifer. So moving on to describe our tiered literacy resources in 6A, we know that our instructional model is quite different in our comprehensive middle school. Um, the tiered system and that philosophy is the same, but the actual resources and the way it works for those students varies um, a little bit. So in tier one, all students have their standard um, English language arts course for their grade level, which again includes access to grade level standards and grade level text. Um, with our summit learning model, all students also receive one on one mentoring. So it's really that support to develop their self directed learning skills to be um, advocates for themselves and to track their own learning and progress. Um, tier one again includes differentiation to target students individual needs and at the middle school as well, we hope to have coaches to provide um, that support to teachers. Uh, both through one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, team collaboration, and professional development. And then um, in tier two at the middle school, again, with the classroom teacher, um, they can target the intensity and the size of the small group based on the needs of the students. So that counts as a tier two intervention. And then we are also really excited to be able to add a reading intervention course into the master schedule. And this is made possible in part by um, the extended day. So we have funding from the Ravenswood Education Foundation um, via the PERI grant to extend the day and agreement and buy-in um, from staff that this is a valuable thing to provide. Um, and this allows us to have seven periods next year instead of six. And that means that some students will actually be able to have two electives. Um, but if it's decided that, or not decided, but identified that the student has a need for intervention of some kind, um, then during the second elective period, they can attend that intervention. And it was incredibly important to us to be able to provide an intervention opportunity to students without um, taking away, uh, for example, uh, an elective. That is something that happens to our students sometimes um, if they are below grade level when they go to high school. And, um, and we, we really don't want that to be part of our model in Ravenswood. We really believe in 
providing an enriched experience for students. Um, and those electives often are really um, not only fun, but also motivating for students. So really excited about that model. Um, and I'll say more about the reading intervention course in a moment. In tier two, we also have the opportunity with um, the many different partners for the middle school to provide additional mentoring for targeted students. And that does address the social emotional learning sort of side of MTSS, but certainly that has a direct impact on students' um, academics as well. And then um, in tier three, again, we have the opportunity to um, use the Sunday system for um, small groups in literacy instruction for students with dyslexia. And then again, our special education assessment process and resources. Um, and then also special education resource classes that um, Jennifer will talk more about. So some key tier one strategies in middle school are um, data analysis again for targeting small group instruction and interventions. We need to make the master schedule for trimester one before the year starts. So it's really important that we're strategically using the data we have available to identify which students would go into which interventions. Um, one of those assessments is the MAP, the Measure of Academic Progress. Another for our rising sixth graders is the Fountas and Pennell Reading Assessment. Um, not this spring, but previous years, we have our CASP scores. Um, in trimesters moving forward, we have the curriculum-based assessments and um, certainly teacher recommendation as well in terms of filtering from tier one into a tier two intervention is really important. Um, and then again, coaching coaching and supporting teachers, especially when we have a number of teachers who are newer to the profession um, or who might be interns is really critical in supporting their growth and reflection. In tier two, um, the, I wanted to share more about the reading intervention class that we're really excited about. The main goals of the class are to fill in instructional gaps without having students miss core instructional time um, and also to have students when they get to high school in those A through G credit bearing levels. So um, levels or courses. So it's really important to us to be providing an intervention to accelerate student learning um, and reclassify students if they are English learners so that they have the opportunity for um, all of the uh, college application credit courses in high school. Um, it's a trimester long course because we are keeping the master schedules for one trimester. It will have a small class size of about 10 students, um, which is uh, really exciting and also really fits what we're trying to accomplish in that time. It will be for four, four days per week for one full period. On a minimum day, the schedule looks a little bit different. And then um, it's in addition, again, to the grade level English language arts course. So it's not pulling students out of that, but it's provided in addition. Um, and then teachers will also use the level literacy intervention kits for small group instruction. And um, as with any intervention, it has the opportunity for students to cycle in and out of the course based on need. So when we see students making growth, um, then that's great. And we want them to be able to exit and go into um, either an elective or a different intervention that they might need. And then same with students who do not start the year in the class based on our ongoing data and observations, we want to be able to cycle students into the course if they need. Um, so we think this is a really critical support and we're excited to be able to provide it. Um, and then here, Jennifer will talk about additional tier three resources in 6-8 as well. You've heard me talk about this a little bit before um, with our resource classes. So we're, we're, we're incredibly excited moving into this next year because we can offer these to our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students. Um, we look at each student's individual plan as well as their path and what their grades are. And we look at what each student needs in terms of support throughout their day in the middle school with their seven periods. So we have the opportunity to offer a resource ELA class for our students with special needs, meaning that in lieu of this, uh, the general education language arts class, they could be in a special education language arts class, which would have fewer students an additional paraprofessional in the room and differentiated work to student to support our students achieving at the levels that we know they can, but they just need a little bit more support in order to do so. So this resource language arts class allows us to do that for our students with special needs. 
In addition, our students also have the opportunity to have a special education study skills class. So it would be one of their classes throughout the day that really helps them stay organized, stay on top of their work, have their planner ready to go, know when their deadlines are. And if you have kids at home, you understand this, opening up their backpack and helping them organize it. Because we find that a lot of our students in general, but many of our students with special needs, you open the backpack and your eyes bug out of your head because you're like, how do you even find anything? So I kind of refer to this class and case managers kind of as mommy at school. Um, it's basically a person who just really makes sure kids know where they're going, know where they're driving, keep ahead of those deadlines and support them with those study skills so that when they go off to high school and college, they're prepared and have those tools in their toolkit. And we don't want to have anybody lose their way just because they needed a little bit more scaffolding and a little bit more structure. So we're excited that these two opportunities, as well as a math resource class, are a tier three intervention for our students with special needs to help them to achieve at the levels we know they can. They just need extra support around them. And I believe that brings us to the end of our presentation. So I can open it up to the floor for questions. Thank you for this presentation. And I will open it up to the board. My questions. apologies. <laughs> My apologies. I'm just kidding. Um, are there any comments or questions uh, yeah. from this presentation? Yes, Trustee Wilson. Yes, to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for the pre I mean, everyone for the presentation. I don't want to leave Eric out. It was good to get a good understanding. I have one general question, and that is, what is the timing between the tiers? So let's say the, the student comes in in August, and it's a, um, and, and, and they, you know, they are in the general class and the teacher is focusing on tier one instruction. How how long will it take for the um, the the need to move that student to tier th two or three happen? Well, two in this case. We our interventions are available um, right away to start the year because we have data from previous years to show where students are, and then we also do a um, beginning of year round of data so that the new um, the new teacher can get to know her new students and to get a sense of where students are um, considering time lapsed over the summer and things like that. So the interventions are available right away after those, inter uh, excuse me, after those assessments have taken place, um, which is usually about a month into the school year. Okay, that's what I needed to hear. Yeah. A lot and of times that's a frustration on the part of teachers and parents that you know within a month that this student needs additional support, but the process and the timing of getting that student involved in those interventions takes months. And here it is the middle of the school year, yet this student still hasn't been able to participate in the interventions. So I'm glad to hear it's about a month. Okay, good. If I can also add on to that question from the perspective of special education, it sometimes really varies on a kid by kid and situation and circumstance by circumstance. I've definitely had a parent come in and bring a kindergartner on the first day of school and we went straight to assessment because the need of that particular student was that he needed to be assessed for a tier three intervention. Um, so it really does vary on a kid by kid, circumstance by circumstance situation. Um, but I think it's a really good question that you ask. And I think um, re Laura, research is you need to uh, implement uh, an intervention for about six weeks to know if it's bringing about a change. And then at the end of six weeks, then you need to, if it's not bringing about a change, you need to do something differently or more. And so I think, you know, I wish I could give you a specific date timeline, but sometimes we just jump to tier three because of the need of the child. And sometimes it is a tier one and then to tier two and then to tier three. So it's really circumstance-based. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's helpful and it's good to hear because that's actually how it should be. Okay, okay good. <laughs> Other questions or comments from the board? I think Trustee Gaona is trying to speak, but you have to unmute yourself, Trustee Gaona. Thanks, no wonder for them listening to me. Uh, yeah, I do uh, like the way you put it, it looks very nice, but I'm really worried about 
the students who are in elementary school. I mean, if we tackle this problem before, we might have less students who get to middle school needing these services. It doesn't mean that they're not gonna need it, but they do need it still, I know. Uh, the thing is that if we wait this long for tier one, tier two, according to tier one, uh, from what I understood, you know, they, they uh, teach the students, the coaches are gonna come and train the teachers, and I don't see intervention yet. And uh, I, I feel, according to me, it, it should be, you know, the student gets tested, not necessarily for special ed, but how are they doing? How do they come back? Because even if they were at some level, uh, when they left, they might come back lower or higher. Uh, it depends on the student and what did they do on the summer too. So if they are lower, I think uh, it should be intervention right away jump to two and not wait until those six weeks or, you know, the three. The worst thing that we can do is, uh, you know, wait until they need, uh, they qualify for special ed because we want to avoid that as much as possible unless you try all the tiers and it didn't help. But I really, I'm really worried about not getting, according to tier one here, I don't see, I only see cautions Coaching and PD provided to teachers, which is great for every student. Um, providing access to grade level is great, but I don't see exactly like, uh, you know, reading especially or reading coaches coming to address those needs of those students who are already walking in the classroom, you know, behind. They already walk in there for whatever reason, you know, inequity, whatever you wanna call it, there are parents who, already work with the kids, they had the time or they know the language, whatever reason. And there are these students who are just learning the language or might not even able to speak. So for me, it's waiting too long and the gap will grow more if we wait until year two, which usually ends up being, you know, you see six weeks, you started to notice, you know, we're gonna do this, try this, try that. And then the tier two, it didn't work. And then you keep going. And meanwhile, the students getting behind. Uh, according to what I see here, the teachers do not sit down with the lower achievers since the beginning and correct me. Oh, if I they, they definitely do. Yes, I can address your question. And it's, it's actually the same thing that I mentioned to Trustee Wilson, which is that the first thing that teachers do when we start the school year is a really wide range of assessments. Um, yes. in literacy and in other subjects as well. Yes, yes. yes, so that is the first thing that we do. It's yes. really important for teachers to get to know their students, to make mm -hmm. them comfortable in the classroom and build those relationships um, and conduct those beginning of year assessments. So on the data slides, you might've noticed it said BOY, that's beginning of year. Um, so the assessments in, especially in case- I know that you do the assessments, but I don't see so it's maybe in especially in K five, the assessments are one on one, so they they do take time, and so in the first couple of weeks of the school year, those assessments are um, completed, and um, as I mentioned, we actually have these intervention resources that I've just named um, available to start at the beginning of the year, and they're structured purposefully in cycles so that students have the opportunity to participate in that intervention. Um, what we're looking for is acceleration, right? So increasing the rate of their learning and catching them up and then hopefully being able to exit them and then cycling other students in. Different students have different rates of, of learning and acclimating to the classroom. So that's important to consider. And one thing that I think, um, I guess the two things I think that are important to add, one is just referencing back to what um, Jennifer just mentioned about um, if there is something that we know about the students or it's indicated by the data that we need to jump to that assessment, for example, in that, exam uh, in that example, then we, we might do that. It really is based on the needs of the students. And then um, second, I, I'll also say that teachers notice that students need time to reacclimate to the classroom when they've been on summer for a couple months. And what you see right away in a student might not be the same level that you're going to see in a month. So there's also some cases where um, you know teachers go through all of their data with 
their principal or their, their literacy coach, and they talk through what might be good resources for the different students. Um, another resource that I, I haven't mentioned yet is that we have a, a, a number of volunteers also who come into our classrooms who can work with students um, in different ways on language and literacy development. Um, and it's really our goal to make the, the services we provide to students um, targeted and, and personalized. So it's not, again, it's not a one size fits all model. Um, and I think like first grade is a good example. We even see more growth in first grade in the second half of the year compared to the first half. We're not waiting for anything. People are teaching their hearts out the whole year. Um, but it just really shows how the students are maturing for their age in that grade level and how receptive they are to the instruction, how they're getting used to um, structures and procedures in the classroom, um, that kind of thing. So our teachers and our interventionists are, are really intentional about what kids are getting based on their needs. I understand that, uh, but the reason I'm telling you is because right here on tier one, I don't mm -hmm. see the explanation about you know, targeting in the intensity and size a small group. That should be part of tier one too. That's what I believe, you know, it, it yeah. should be happening because we already have, since kindergarten actually, but we already get some recommendation when they're placing the kindergartners to first grade, where they do the cars right. and say, you know, this is still my need, this and this and this, and usually they still need it when they yeah. come back. Uh, it's a, common, it's a common misconception that tier one is the only thing that happens in the classroom with the classroom teacher. So that's exactly what you just said. That's exactly why we called out here that there's a tier two happens in the classroom as well. So just because it's not listed in tier one doesn't mean it's not happening. So two important things that I can reiterate, differentiation to target students' individual needs is already part of tier one, like one-on-one -on -one reading or writing conferences, um, small group instruction like strategy groups. And then tier two, even though it's listed under tier two in the yellow band, mm -hmm. that first bullet is still happening in the classroom. So as I mentioned, when teachers see a need for um, increased support for that student, then they're the instructional decision maker. They, they will say, how can I either um, increase the intensity, like the frequency of the group or the length of the group, um, and then the size, like decreasing the size um, or doing more one-on-one -on -one conferences based on the need of the students. So um, exactly what you said, that is in there. So my question to you is, uh, if, um, uh, how often would a coach, teacher, you know, not the regular teacher because they have the whole, mm -hmm. the whole class and they still need to meet everybody's needs and they do try. I know that I do, they do because I have certain teachers at Ravensgood and also the place where I work, that they do sit down in small groups, but there is a point where they need more instruction than that. Uh, so at what point does the coaching teacher sit down with a small group mm -hmm. to work with those students? That the, those groups start a couple weeks into the school year once the assessment has taken place. Couple weeks. So they did do that last year they sat down the coaches i'm not talking about the reading specialist the coaches sat down with students who are low on their uh language arts academic skills yes reading. and it's it's the same person it's a um the title actually has a slash in it because they do serve multiple roles the same person so that's why the title of the role is literacy coach slash reading specialist because they coach teachers. So that's, support, that's about supporting teachers and they provide reading intervention. And so it's the same person um, who does both. And that's actually really powerful because then the, the coaches have that firsthand experience with students who are struggling and they're you know going in and out of classrooms every day to work with those students. Um, and so they're supporting the teacher by providing that in, extra intervention to the students, direct service and then also coaching the teacher and serving as a thought partner to reflect on uh, moving students. Maybe to, to the whole there, class. Needs to, there needs to be some more clarification because I have heard from some coaches that, uh, or teachers that the coaches do not have the time to sit down with the kids because they need to be coaching the teachers and they have a lot of other more obligations like 
coaching the teachers. So they have less time than a reading specialist. And that's why I'm asking because I want to get yeah, it. That is, yes, that's a great question. So the role is designed to be 50-50 intentionally. And I think that it's really important to consider when a, um, a coach slash specialist is teaching one small group, that's about four, three, four, five students at a time, usually. Okay. Um, and they, they will serve about four groups at a time in any given cycle. So four times four, that's about 16 students. Okay. When, the when the coach is coaching a teacher, that teacher's practice is impacting the entire class. Of course. And so, right, exactly. And so that impact is huge and cannot be understated. Our students really deserve the best targeted interventions. And it's important for us to remember that they spend the vast majority of their time with their classroom teacher. And so in 6-8, that's with their core subject teachers. And in K-5, that's with their one main classroom teacher. And the um, quality of instruction they receive in that, in that classroom, their relationship with the teacher, that is what research shows is the number one factor on student achievement. And it's our major goal as stated in our strategic plan to raise our student achievement in English language arts. So we need to do that for all of our students, not just 16 at a time. And we're really fortunate to be able to have this role and um, these like very special people, if I don't say so myself, in these roles who can do both of those things. Those are, they're actually very, very different but complementary skill sets. And that's exactly the power of why we created that, that role. So you, so the small groups might serve 16 students at a time, um, but then the coaching of like six different teachers could serve 180 students at a time. And that's really what, what our students need. That's what our data shows. I wanna make sure that data gets kept so we can see the improvement or we can see if it didn't work, please. Because it seems like other times they have, not the inconsistency in and um, getting that data and there's no way to see if that program was working. Yeah, was. we actually just showed it in the first section. So the 1920, I'm sorry, but what? I know you did, but for now on. Oh, to continue. Past, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in the past we didn't have yeah. it. Um, we've been, we have had the, the um, literacy coach intervention role for the last three years and we've been collecting the same data over the course of this role. And we've consistently shown, um, we've consistently seen from the teachers that students who are receiving that small group intervention are growing at a faster rate than students who don't receive intervention. Um, and that's showing the value add. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else with questions or comments? I have a question to the yes. chair. Yes, Trustee me here. Thank you. Um, Laura, is this enough? And, and I hope I'm not asking this. I, I don't mean this to be offensive or anything, but I'm asking really like, is this enough? You know, knowing the list of um, supporting all of our students and knowing the big gap we have between achievement um, or folks being, you know, a proficient or, you know, at grade level or, you know, above, um, is this enough or should we be building in more opportunities for um, literacy uh, or, you know, lit clubs, whatever, just throughout the day? And I, I know the schedule is like crazy as it is, there's not yeah. more time, but I'm just wondering in order to really, you know, have folks comprehension be where it should be, their reading skills be where there should be. I imagine if I was gonna do it, I'd just have someone reading all the time and us talking about that reading all the time so i'm just wondering yeah is this enough what yeah yeah that, that's a great question i mean i think like i said our student achievement in english language arts is not where we want it to be we we are really committed to increasing our student outcomes so that our students are getting a super solid foundation in um, literacy and language, and that really undergirds so much of their future success. Um, it's tricky because we have a limited amount of resources and a limited amount of time. And if you look at the instructional day of a K-5 teacher, it is mostly, um, or I would say at least half literacy instruction, reading, writing, phonics, read aloud, 
um, English language development, um, not to mention literacy and language development that's integrated into the other subject areas. Um, and we do feel that tension because uh, as we also know, our math achievement data is lower than our ELA achievement data. So it's also not showing that there's other things that we're going to set aside and focus more on literacy, if that makes sense. Um, I think in terms of resources, um, it's, I think it's really hard. It's, it's not enough. And I, and I really have to say that I think that that's a, a product of structural inequalities in our society. Um, and which are getting more challenging with the um, expected recession and budget cuts in the next few years. So I, I don't want to sugarcoat that. Through the chair. Yes. I, I was actually going to comment on that. I'm glad that you mentioned that because the reality is that reading can not only be taught in the classroom. Okay. It has to also be taught and encouraged at home. And part of our challenge is that we have kids who return to homes where reading is not at all promoted. They may not have books, they may not have magazines, they're not encouraged to read. So all of that is part of it. Everything can't, you know, everything in the classroom you can provide as much as you can, but there are things that have to happen outside of the classroom to further encourage that. Now, maybe one of the things that we can do, and I think we have been doing this, is sending books home or getting, giving kids the opportunity to have books in their home. So, you know, again, there's some other things, but everything, you know, the classroom is not gonna be the solid answer. Tristy Wilson, to your point, that's why I'm a strong advocate of emphasizing on parent engagement because parents are our greatest allies to what we're doing with kids in the classroom because if they don't continue it when they go home, it's almost like we're resetting every day. Um, but to Tristy Shabomihin's point, I mean, her question was very clear and, and it was kind of what was running through my head, not just is this enough, but I was beginning to think how many, what's the percentage of our students that are tier two and tier three? And is this enough capacity to be able to meet those student needs? And I mean, I think you answered saying, you know, resources are limited and we're doing the best we can, but I believe that, you know, seeing gains and improvements in this area, I just think literacy is such a key component to your entire educational career. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a strong base, you are likely to struggle for the rest of your educational career. And not to say you can't overcome it, but it will be a challenge. And I believe that our budget should reflect our priorities. And I believe that this was one of our main priorities in our strategic plan. So I get we don't have all the money that we need to completely make that look like the model we want it to look like to be able to support all our students. But I do think as we're looking to the budget and budget planning, and I know we're having to look at the budget for other reasons, because we're actually going to be running into some additional cuts given the situation with COVID-19 and its impacts and the governor's budget and whatnot. But I don't think this is some, I don't think this is an area that we can cut corners on. For me, mm -hmm. I, I'm deeply passionate about investing as much resources as possible into this and not and not skimping. And I'd rather take look at other areas and figure out how we can, you know, readjust things to be able to further support this. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I know there's been this big, big controversy about the reading recovery teachers. For me, it's not about any group. It's about outcomes for students. It's about if it's not reading recovering teachers, what is it? And you obviously clearly walked us through, you know, these tiered literacy um responsive measures uh, and resources for, for students. But I feel like this goes way beyond, like our needs are go way past this, way, way past this. And I hope, I know usually we have funders that are listening in and yeah. they do everything they can to help fundraise and support us in every way they can. Um, but this continues to be a significant need for our district and I think it's important for us to 
once again, as we're looking at the budget and having to figure out where reductions are coming, we need to also move the money so it fits with our priorities. And I think this is a significant priority of us. So yeah. thank you for this presentation. I have another, another comment, please. Um, after that, you spoke. I'm looking at the comments and I see one. I know you told me that they sit down right away, but I hear, see something here and it must be from a teacher. I don't know who did it, but it says, they did not sit down with small groups within the first two weeks. They do not sell the groups consistently because they have additional responsibilities. Coaches dropped groups when we went to distance learning. So I would like something to be consistent. In, and if this is not working, I mean, this is the best thing that the kids could do. And I, I do get it and I feel with Ms. Wilson, many parents do not even like books. I, I work at the Palo Alto School District and I would drive my van with so many books and you know, trade in and said, I'll come back next week. And you know, you have to give them back to me. And sometimes I came back and the kids said, my mom clean up and throw them all to the trash. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, but I had enough. But those kids who were reading are the ones who got better. And, and what I did, and perhaps we need to do this. I don't know, I'm just thinking because the kids need to like reading, to love reading. Yes. They cannot love it if yes. they don't have books at home. If yes. nobody sits down with them to read, you need to sit down and read them. So maybe what I was doing before for Palo Alto, I went home by home and sat down with the kids and I read. And even the little ones came to sit down with me. So they got used to it and those kids, didn't need it anymore of the teaching to love our books because they got it. I don't know what can we do, but we need to address this. And I understand that some parents, uh, they do have their own way. You know, we clean up, let's throw everything away. I'm not saying all of them, but some of them did. But I will give them more books. And I didn't get upset that, you know, just here they are more. And we need to do change that. I don't know how, so I'm open to suggestions. I can do that again if you know, if that's possible. Yes, Trustee Wilson. So before we end, I just want to say that I uh, appreciate the fact that part of the emphasis is training the classroom teacher to lead the effort around literacy, because unless that classroom teacher has a handle on it, we'd have to bring in an intervention specialist for every other kid. And so the, 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 the overall goal is to train the teaching staff so that they're able to manage the tier one and when necessary, the tier two. So I, I agree with the approach. All right, we're gonna have to move on from this item, but I know we, we have do group. have comments, yeah. Trustee Fitch, if you can please call. Yeah, we have uh, Diana, Kri Ms. Krippendorf. And then we have one other person who has their hand raised. Okay, good. Um, I'm, I, I'm happy to see that all these good things are happening for our struggling readers, but I agree with the board members there that it's not enough, they need more. Um, I'm a long-term dedicated teacher here in Ravenswood. I, I'm uh, reading recovery certified. I did three students this uh, beginning and all, all Two were at pre-A's and one was at a B and they all reached grade level within the 20 weeks or before. I have national board um, certification with uh, focus on reading and language arts and I have an MA in with an emphasis in reading. I'm here to speak on behalf of our first and fifth to first to fifth grade struggling readers. These re students desperately need and deserve extra instruction, time and practice. Um, it, this works in with the equity and social justice that superintendent talked about and empathy and tenacity don't settle. Um, we need to empower every student to reach their potential. I'm advocating for them just like you are and we don't wanna settle for less. Um, the classroom teachers have very limited time to do the reading groups with very low readers. Struggling readers need consistent daily small level groups to learn and practice reading, writing, and speaking out loud to progress. The new model implemented this past year has shown that TOSAs are extremely busy, which was said. TOSAs mostly do reading groups for bubble kids. Those are the students that are reading close to grade level. Today I was told by a TOSA in the union meeting that TOSAs weren't ever supposed to work with the really low readers. They were meant to work with the bubble kids to bring the whole grade up. 
More reading intervention is needing, needed for our struggling students. There are students from Willow who will be in fifth grade next year who are reading at beginning kindergarten levels A and B. There are many, many students who need extra support. Reading is the most important skill because all learning depends on reading. In line with the Ravenswood City School District goals, reading empowers students and helps them reach their potentials, goals, and dreams. Right. Students can access, access the curriculum as readers. We're at time. Can I please finish? We're at time. Can I please finish? I just have a little more. What's a little more? Like, like maybe one minute or less. Um, we'll give you like 20 seconds to wrap up. Okay. Um, Next year, there's going to be less TOSA time because of the uh, high uh, coaching and part time. And uh, um, for this year, they weren't able to meet with their own groups that they were supposed to very often. I'm requesting that you look into the great need and big gap for our young students' benefit and can keep reading, inter keep reading intervention. Helping struggling readers should not be deferred until middle school. Um, they need help now. I'm speaking on behalf of Gabriel, Julieta, Larissa, Espady, Julie, Roseman, Eduardo, sorry, Monkley, and the other ones that need We're help. Time again. Please, you, open, please open your eyes and do something about this. Thank, thank you. you. Two minutes. All right. So you guys should give three minutes. Two is so short. Solomon, we're going on to the next. Is there any other speakers? Yeah, there's two more speakers. We have uh, Joni. And then Mr. Berman. President Polito, would we want to respond to each speaker afterward, after all speakers? Um, you, yeah, you can if you feel like you have a response. So. Okay. Joni, you should be able to speak now. Yeah, I am. Um, I agree with what Diana's saying. I've been teaching in the Ravenswood School District for the past three years. and. From my experience, um, the presentation was wonderful. And I just want to say that, but from my experience, for example, last year, two thirds of the first graders that were entering um, from kindergarten were below kindergarten level. So it was a challenge just to get them up to the beginning of first year level, and then hopefully towards uh, level I, which is quite a big leap for them, especially since they're second language learners. Um, I believe that it's important to put highly qualified teachers into those positions because even the um, the qualifications that were being required by the district when they were hiring the um, teachers of special assignment and morning reading specialists, those requirements were not met and other teachers were putting in that in place. And I just think that we need, they really need highly qualified teachers to teach. And if, um, I want to piggyback on what Gina said that children deserve to be empowered all children do to reach their full potential and reading is power. And if we want to empower our kids here in Ravenswood, we have to focus on literacy and we need to bring in highly qualified reading specialists. And the problem that I see, and I'm just one person and I won't be there next year. I'm just doing this because I care so much about the district um, is that the, the says are spending so much time with we have such a high turnover of teachers in the Ravenswood School District from my experience just in the last three years that they spend a lot of time coaching new teachers. And so um, I don't see how they could, they weren't able to consistently meet with groups. And because of the COVID and the fact that the second half of the year is when students really grow, that, um, you know, we've lost that with the COVID. So, I mean, we really need to look at this, you guys do as a district. This is huge, it's important. And I agree with Anna so much. I, I think the panel was amazing with their questions. And um, I, the other thing is, I don't see how that they can have oh, the coaches because the coaches can have 20 seconds. <laughs> because the coaches and our school at Brentwood were only on board since the beginning of this last school year. So they only started like in August. So we don't have three years of data for those teachers in Brentwood. That's all I wanna say. Thank you so much for your time. Thank and you. I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker that we have is Mr. Uh, Berman. Mr. Berman, you have two minutes. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you guys for your time. Uh, I appreciate the whole presentation and I see that you're all working really hard and looking at the data and 
looking at the best solutions we can come up with to um, meet the needs for all of our all of our learners. Um, I just want to echo what Diana said and um, what has been brought up in this meeting about the lower readers and that TOSA doesn't have enough time and it's not realistic based on the current model, the current TOSA model to reach all of the needs of the um, struggling readers. And I just want to, um, I don't remember who brought this fact up, but um, a lot of our families they come from a lot of our kids come from families who might not speak the language and don't have that sort of extracurricular support to use the language in the in the household and to read in the household and that might not even be encouraged in the house so i just want to stress on it's pivotal that we get reading specialists or so do we just make the most of our time in class with the kids because that's really the most support they're going to get in their day and if any support that they're going to get, especially in English. And um, in addition to that, I just want to share, um, that's been one of the struggles, one of the struggles that I've faced with this distance learning that I'm seeing is that a lot of parents aren't able to support their kids, whether their schedules are too busy or whether they're unable to due to the language barrier. So I've seen a huge decline in, um, uh, with um, the Zoom chats, I've noticed a huge decline in English skills for a good majority of my students. And not only that, but a lot of assignments aren't even being completed or encouraged to be completed by families at their houses. So I just think it's very, it's, I, I know your hearts are all in the right places and you're trying your best and you're trying to balance a budget, but it's just really important that we make the most of our time while we have the kids in the classroom, because that's for most of them, all the support they're getting in the English language and curriculum. And you're at time, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tina, I know you had comments or one more speaker. I believe there's one more speaker. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, we have Rhonda White. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Anna, I know your question. I'm not speaking as the union president. I'm speaking as Rhonda White, the, the, the literacy coach and former reading recovery teacher. Something I don't want, and I wasn't going to speak today, something I don't want convoluted is that the coaches were to replace the reading recovery teachers or that the funding for the reading reto recovery teachers went to the TOSAs. The reading recovery are a set of highly skilled teachers who work with a specific set of students and do a specific set of things, particularly one-on-one -on -one and later doing small groups. Coaches, uh, literacy intervention specialists have three main roles. One, sorry, I just realized my video was off, I apologize. One, they serve as coaches to beef up tier one instruction, which is the best offense for our students to get the best out the gate. Two, they offer small group instruction for students. And three, they act as teacher in charge. So you have some literacy coaches as well as some reading recovery teachers who may or may not get pulled to, uh, to do other duties as assigned. That could be there is no sub. That could be you're covering because a teacher needs to go to an IEP. So what I don't want to do is sit here and think that we're pitting reading recovery teachers against TOSAs because we're all teachers. We're all here for student achievement and for the betterment of the students of Ravenswood. And what's happening is that darts and stones are being thrown and people get hurt. And I don't care about any of that, but my kids. So Reading, should reading recovery continue? Yes, it's a great tier C program. But the reality is we don't have a funder and we don't have a funder who's knocking on our door to pay for it. So I understand that. Right now we have a funder who is covering coaches, a portion of them. So I think we need to remember, time. I understand. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna beg like my other people for another minute. So I just wanna say, what you say 20 seconds? 
Wow, Polito, you're really being cheap today. Just being fair, just being fair. Got it. So I just want to make sure we remember it's not reading recovery teachers versus coaches. It is about what we give our students and reading recovery teachers and coaches both serve a purpose. However, we don't have funding and there's no one knocking down our door to give us funding for reading recovery. Unless somebody got a billionaire in their pocket they ain't told me about. Thank you. Thank you. I, okay, so uh, I know Gina has some responses she'd like to I, share. I have a brief statement. Mm -hmm. um, yes, our strategic priority is to focus on literacy. Reading does empower students. We have limited funding, limited resources. So we have to look at the data to strategize how to allocate our resources. The state, the data speaks volumes. Uh, I know there's a lot of conversation going on in the chat. It's very subjective. We have to be objective when it comes to making decisions that are difficult decisions. We can go back to the data chart and look at that. We need to maximize and build the expertise of all of our teachers in front of our students. That means we need individuals who not only can serve reading intervention, but can educate and support and coach teachers to be able to effectively deliver tier one instruction. Tier two, tier three, will only get them to a certain level until we get tier one down. Bottom line, our data reflects the successes of a couple of programs. And we need to look at that data to, to make the decision on where we're gonna put our money and our resources. But I don't know if you wanted to add anything else in response to speakers. Um, I think that what you just said, Gina, was really well stated. I know that we do need to move on for the sake of time. And I think considering those limited resources in our strategic allocation is exactly what we've been doing. And um, I think we all agree about empowering our students through language and literacy. And I'll um, add on to that as um, President Polito mentioned, empowering our parents as well. We know that um, some of our parents might not speak English or some of our parents um, might not have attended much school themselves, but that doesn't make them any less valuable as people and as resources and as their child's first teacher. Um, and parent, parent support and involvement is part of our strategic plan as well. Um, and so I agree with the trustees who who mentioned how important and valuable that is. And I just wanna make it really clear that we see parents as a huge um, asset and important part of our community. And now more than ever, right? With distance learning and with some type of distance learning guaranteed to continue next year, basically. Um, and so that's something that we will continue to work on as well. I also want to just remind everyone, this isn't the first time we're having this conversation. This has been a conversation that we've had, I think, at least over the past year. So this is not something we're trying to brush through. We're actually coming back to the conversation because we know there's a lot more questions now that we're kind of moving away from the previous model and transitioning to the new one. So we're actually just revisiting for the sake of questions from the public or, you know, whatever doubts or concerns there are. But this is this is not something that we've taken lightly, and this is something that we've been looking at for um, an extensive amount of time. Um, and I think we're going to have to continue to look at it. This is not the end of it. Um, to every all the speakers' point, I mean, I don't, I can't say I disagree with any of the points about what our students need and what can our district do. Um, I think those are conversations we're going to have to continue to have. I don't think the conversation ends here, but I do want to say that this isn't something we've brushed over. This is something that has been in conversation for quite some time. And unfortunately we're in this position right now where we, we, we're not able to have everything we need, but I'm sure we're all gonna work collectively to get there or get cl close to it as possible. And um, if anyone feels like they have a lot more to say than these meetings allow, because as you can imagine, we have a lot of items in the agenda. You know, I encourage everyone to submit letters to the board. You're able to do that and you can express or you know reach out to a board member and you know, further elaborate your opinion. Um, but we, we do have a responsibility to manage the meeting. And as I said, we've, we've had this topic on the agenda 
and have had this discussion uh, a good amount of time. So Trustee Gauna, right now we're going to have to move on because in the interest of time, it's 910 and we still have, and we have, we had a great lengthy discussion on this, um, but we do need to, to move to the next item, um, which is, uh, BGCP. BGCP. Yes, Boys and Girls Club. I'm going to help present along with Jose Gonzalez to um, from the Boys and Girls Club, fill in additional information. And we're going to share the screen shortly. Yeah. Okay. What? We can hear you, Jose. Salome, are you able to share the presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So as you know, we um, are going to be able to partner. We would like to be able to partner with the Boys and Girls Club to offer um, the virtual summer program. Um, there's a lot of debate on how we were going to uh, offer summer school program, whether or not it was going to be in person, virtual. Um, our extended school year will also be virtual along with other 20 districts in the county. And so it was agreed upon that, that the offering of the program would also be done virtually for our students um, kindergarten through eighth grade. Next slide. So here is um, the successes of measures and success indicators um, for the program. The goal is to retain 75% of the middle school who are already in the Boys and Girls Club and 65% of the elementary students who are in the, pro in the summer program who are already in the Boys and Girls Club. Um, we would like to promote active membership and so enrolled students that are currently in attendance and they would be able to participate in two virtual sessions each week. They would be enrolled, uh, each student, enrolled students will receive at least two virtual wellness check-ins during summer program. And then on the average, when they do have virtual groups, um, the goal is to have five or more students attend any 80% of those groups. Um, in terms of deliver engagement, gauging virtual summer program, 90% of the instructor, instructors submit three complete uh, two-week virtual sessions, and 80% of the classes are to be rated as high quality, and 80% of the students are to report feeling supported and cared for by staff um, at GCP. Jose, did you want to clarify how they're going to be measuring these successes? Hi everyone, it's nice to be here uh, with all of you. Uh, yes, yeah, so the way that we're going to you know, uh, measure these is to really look at our Salesforce data, um, really looking at uh, attendance rates from our students, uh, mostly for the retaining BGCP members and promoting active membership. For the delivering engaging virtual summer program, we're going to leverage our current PQA assessment, program quality assessment really targeting the major focus of engagement. So we were, the way we, were, we designed the program was really like, what can we do to engage students and so that they come to our programs? And so the design came from that. And so the focus from that white cart uh, PQA rubric will be primarily on engagement. And then for the feeling supported, um, students will be asked uh, in like a virtual community meeting or a virtual community circle how supported they feel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. On the next slide are the instructors and staff from the Boys and Girls Club will work approximately five and a half hours. Uh, we'll have five and a half hour work days working six weeks out of the summer. Um, you can see from past summer programs, the amount of time that has been put in. For the summer 2020 virtual program, they will have 40 hours of training. Um, the program will be a six week program. Again, they will work five and a half hours, total of 205 hours. 
and just looking into how the program will be developed. Um, they consider the appropriateness, appropriateness of screen time and the maximum number of students per live virtual sessions. Um, K-8 districts were surveyed, K students in, in, in several districts were surveyed about whether a full-time program or part-time program would be most appropriate. Um, HR was also consulted, this is through the Boys and Girls Club, HR was consulted about appropriate breaks, lunches, et cetera. And then also the length of program, um, whether or not it should be a total of six weeks was determined based on the need and, uh, to engage students longer during this time. And then of course, the impact, the financial impact for staff. Any additional information on this, Jose? No, I think the, the biggest thing here is that um, BGCP has never offered a six week program before, uh, but given our virtual platform or virtual approach, um, and given that students would be engaging in less hours technically because they're not in the classroom, we thought that engaging them longer for six weeks uh, was a better fit for this time around. Okay. And this just shows um, the training that's going to take place on the next slide. So the virtual program will start for them um, June 15th through the 19th in regards to training and prepping for the program. Um, the, there will be a time off for July 4th on the 3rd. And the program will go from June 22nd through July 31st. Next slide. And these are the program offerings per grade band. So you see the elementary and the middle school. And students will be able, they're the same for both the grade levels in terms of the offerings. Um, specifically though, there will be more opportunity for engagement with, for the middle school students to have more synchronous interaction with um, adults. Did you wanna add more to this one, Jose? Yeah, so they look very similar. And um, when we did the virtual programming during the school year, there were some limitations with elementary school where we could only really engage with them over the phone. Um, but given our strong partnership with the district, we've been able to get um, access to students. And so now we're actually gonna be moving more towards live virtual sessions with all kids. Um, so we're really excited about that because kids were telling us that that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to see each other. And if you see under middle school, you'll see one on two middle school success advising that will continue. Um, and that's more of that one on two attention, one student, two staff members discussing time management or stress or things like that. So that's more of our case management um, approach for middle school. Okay. And so and this, here, yeah, go ahead, Jose. Okay. Um, so then here we, we, we bucket the programming into two major buckets. The first one is individual programming, which comes in the form of one student and two adults, and then group programming, which would still have two adults um, and a group of students, uh, 10 max. Um, so this is, this is the way we thought about our programming before we started to design it. You can tell, Salman, so, so, you can go to the next slide for Jose. And then here is our schedule. Um, if you look at the beginning, it's individual programming. And what this means is a general wellness check-in for students. Just how are they doing? How's it going? What have you been up to really to maintain our relationships with kids um, and also to check in on what needs they, they have. Um, we have heard that rent assistance is something so we connect them with services. Um, and then we have camp culture, which is something we're trying to emulate from Galileo. Um, where kids are going to be celebrated for, for embodying the BGCP values and where there's probably an activity that they can do together. Um, and then the group programming, which is the meat of our program, is the enrichment piece and also the virtual community meetings, which act like a um, community building circle. Um, so that's the, the schedule for our day. And then we look at the instructor level. Um, and so this is kind of what an instructor would see. Um, so if you see at the individual programming, that would be check in with Jose, check in with George and check in with Peter um, for the individual programming. And then there would be two cycles of that. So all students in that one class would get at least two check-ins. Um, and then the rest is 
really instructor selected and we're serving families now and serving kids to see what enrichment classes they want offered so we can design it um, around what they would like to see. Um, so far, art is very popular um, and a cooking class. So we're trying to see like, how can we do that in a virtual setting? Um, and here are some of the potential enrichment offerings. We were looking at STEM, so creating something, literacy, math games, movement and sports, visual arts, SEL, um, and Speak Your Mind, which is a group discussion almost operating like a Socratic seminar. For middle school, we've selected class texts that align to um, the Eureka or expeditionary learning curriculum. And so they'll have a sixth grade text, a seventh grade text, an eighth grade text if they would like to run uh, a book club um, together virtually. And then we'll look into our platforms that we'll be using. You can go to the next slide. Uh, we'll be using Kahoot. Um, so all of our students will have access to Kahoot. Um, we'll, our instructors will, where they're able to share their screen, run a fun activity with students, whether it's math games, maybe it's an English um, game, like an ELA by Kahoot, or it could be a science game. So these are one of the platforms that we're going to use. And then the next one is Nearpod. And we're really excited about Nearpod. And we learned about it through uh, interviewing Boys and Girls Clubs of Portland, who said that they had a lot of success with engagement using this um, platform. It's pretty much ready to go enrichment with the slides, with objectives. I love objectives because then you can assess for learning at the end. Um, and it also has interactive activities where kids can communicate with you, videos. So it's all set for our instructors. And this is what they will primarily use uh, to plan for their enrichment classes. So we also considered what materials do kids have um, and what can we do to limit what they might need. And so we thought about let's give let's let's distribute materials that are basic materials, crayons, markers, color pencils, watercolors, construction paper. Um, so then instructors when they're planning for their enrichment class, they know, we know they at least have these materials and we can plan accordingly for those. Um, so we purchased them and we are going to be putting them in bags and distributing to kids along with um, the class text for middle school students. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. And that's our program. All right. Well, thank you for that presentation. I will ask the board if they have any questions or comments regarding the program or the MOU. I, I have a quick question through the chair. Uh, I'm wondering about since this will all be um, digital um, and virtual, what are you doing to plan for um, internet accessibility? Uh, in terms of, you know, the homes having, you know, enough bandwidth, you know, on a, you know, a mobile Wi-Fi unit or something like that. And I don't know if BGCP is covering that or Ravenswood or what. We actually um, are coordinating efforts with the foundation and CZI, and they have already given us the blessing to be able to hold on to the hotspots for students participating in summer school. We would just have to bring it back to the board to extend the MOU. Got it. Thank you. And we're also currently surveying students um, and families to see if there's anything like additional they need in terms of technology uh, or uh, access to internet as well. Yeah, this is Solomon. I just wanted to point out that uh, Boys and Girls Club has been a, re a really strong partner in our technology distribution. They, um, they volunteered at a number of our sites, so we're pretty confident that um, we can work together with them to make sure um, everything is in the hands of the students that's necessary. I also, I also just wanna add one more point in terms of engagement. Um, they are gonna continue working with students already in the program, which is half the battle in regards to introduction and getting to know uh, instructors and what have you. And so um, we're going to be able to utilize, I believe Jose, you can correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. the instructors who are already um, working at the sites. That's right, they'll be the instructors that are currently there. Um, and then serving the students that 
that BGCP has worked with just to continue the relationship with their instructors and hopefully there is a strong start to the school year with that too. Great. I know we have a long standing relationship with the Boys and Girls Club. <laughs> and um, so thank you for all those years of partnering with Ravenswood and being good neighbors. So thank you very much. Um, I believe this is an action item for the board. So there is nothing else. I will entertain a motion. Uh, through the chair, I'll make a motion to approve item 9B, uh, the MOU between Ravenswood and the Boys and Girls Club. I'll second. Roll call, please. President Polito. Aye. Vice President Wilson. You're on mute. Sorry. Aye. Trustee Fitch. Aye. Trustee Guyana. Aye. Trustee Shabomihin. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for Jose. your partnership. Yeah, thank you all. All right, item 10A, consideration to approve the job description for a teacher on special assignment for math and science, coach six through eight. Thank you, Trustee Blito, Director of uh, Human Resources, Tony Stone. I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Um, this first item ties directly into the presentation you saw earlier related to our tier one instruction. So this math science coach will support the middle school by coaching teachers, uh, focusing on those new teachers and building their, their tier one instruction. Thank you. Questions or comments? Uh, yeah, to the chair, I had, I had a question about the uh, math and science position. Um, I just wanna make sure I didn't miss something, but I see that it says the common core state standards, but I'm wondering if for science, if we're gonna include the NGSS, the next generation science standards in that, um, cause I wanna make sure that what whoever we get is up to date on um, the math and science standards. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And I can update the job description with that tweak if you'd like. I, I, I would. I don't know about the rest of the board, but I think having the language of NGSS would be good. I 100% agree. I mean, that's what we're moving towards. And I think it would be important with value add. I don't see any opposition from any board members. So if we could add that, Tony, that'd be great. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, if there's nothing else, I can entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the job description on item 10A with the NGSS change to it. I'll second. Roll we'll call, please. President Polito? Aye. Vice President Wilson? Aye. Trustee Fitch? Aye. Trustee Guyana? Aye. Trustee Shabomihi? Aye. Motion carries five to zero. We are able to now move to item 10B to approve the job description for audiovisual coordinator. Yeah, so this job description is really around the distance learning, creating a, a robust how-to platform. I apologize if the chimes in the background are annoying. <laughs> so it's a little windy down here in South San Jose. Um, to, to build a robust distance learning how-to platform and also to support the middle school with their new eSports and then continue the upgrades um, district-wide to our audiovisual uh, gyms, um, office spaces, meeting rooms, et cetera. Questions or comments from the board? All right, I'll entertain okay, I'll the chair. Yes. Um, is this position to help Solomon? <laughs> He doesn't need help. <laughs> That's correct. He would be a direct report to Solomon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just joking, Solomon. <laughs> I know. Thank you. All right. Anyone want to make a motion? To the chair, then I'll make the motion that we approve the job description for the audio visual coordinator. I'll second. Roll call, please. President Polito. Aye. Vice President Wilson. Yes. Trustee Fitch. Aye. Trustee Guyona. I'm sorry, you were muted. Trustee Guyona. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Shabomahin. Aye. 
Motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. I believe that leaves us at our last HR item. And this is a consideration to approve the job description for teacher on special assignment for ELA and SSS coach. That's right. So much like the math science coach, this coach will support the middle school with ELA and social studies, focusing specifically on new teacher support and building that tier one instruction. Any question, questions or comments on this item? All right, I'll entertain a motion. So I'll, I'll move that we approve of the job description for a teacher on special assignment, um, ELA SS coach six through eighth grade. My second. Roll call please. President Polito. Aye. Vice President Wilson. Yes. Trustee Fitch. Aye. Trustee Diana. Sorry, you're on mute again. Yes. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Shabo Mahim. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. So we are on the last item, which is the section for the Board of Trustees. The first item is on 11A. No one is absent. So we will move right along to 11B, which is the presentation of board policies. So this is for the recruitment and selection for first reading and action unless there's any changes or amendments to it or people would like additional time. Any, any questions, comments, revisions? All right, I'll entertain a motion then. So through the chair, mm -hmm. I'll move that we approve of um, um, the first reading of B board policy 411, 4211, and 4311. I'll second. Roll call, please. President Polito. Aye. Vice President Wilson. Yes. Trustee Fitch. Aye. Trustee Guyona. Aye. Trustee Shibomi. Hi. Okay, motion carries five to zero. So now we have a couple of reports. The first one is from the naming of school committee. There's an update that you are all providing the board and the public. Right, thank you, the yes. chair. Yes. Um, so um, we are, um, we have a number of teachers who have um, submitted their names for consideration. We only have uh, four parents so far. So I, I'm requesting that if you as a board member have not um, recommended anybody or nominated or suggested anybody, um, can you please forward those names to Maria by midweek next week so that we can coordinate a meeting for the, um, the people. We wanna make sure that we don't have more teachers than we have parents from the community engaged in this process. Yeah, and I just want to, you know, I'll personally apologize because I have yet to submit names, but this is really critical and important because we're naming two schools and this is going to be reflecting of an entire community and usually names don't get changed very often. So I know we have all have a lot going on, um, but I think it's really important that we make the time to select uh, community members. It'd be great if for parents, and even if you don't maybe have a parent, a community member, because these schools are going to transcend a certain staff or a certain parent group. They're going to continue on. So as many community members as possible, please send them uh, Trustee Wilson and Trustee Galena's way. Um, so I would personally apologize for, for not submitting names, but I know how important this is, so we really got to get on it. So thank you for reminding us all. Okay. All right, so 11D is a consideration to nominate a board member for the reopening school task force. So as we've heard in many presentations already, um, there's a task force that's been put together to reopen uh, for fall and they're gonna be considering different scenarios, but just as there are different stakeholders, we believe that it was important to allow the board to have an opportunity to participate if, if if they uh, so desired. 
So uh, we're here, we put it on the agenda. It's a, it's a task force, it's not a committee. A committee is board led. If you decide to accept to participate in this, you are a participant of and it's staff led. Um, so it will be staff led task force. And as a board member, you're just participating. So staff is setting the agenda, meeting conversations. And as a board member, you're just participating. Unlike subcommittees where, you know, the, the board has a strong say over the agenda and they tend to run the meetings in conjunction with the superintendent. So is there a board member or two that are uh, very passionate about being on this committee? If you could please say so now. Nobody else. Oh, Trustee Gone, I believe you said in email that you you were very interested in participating. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else wants to cut me off. I don't mind. Okay. I think there's interest through the chair too. So you don't have to do it if you want to be on a go for it, but I don't think you have to be like if no one else, because I think oh. there's other interest. Okay. If it matters at all. I don't know. All right. So yeah, are you gonna say Trustee Wilson? Yeah, so I would actually be interested in serving on it. I have um, some thoughts and really some concerns about making sure, and, and as being part of the facilities committee, that's the other piece that I think can tie into that because there are definitely going to be some facility things that we, modifications that we need to make in order to accommodate the new um, uh, guidelines. So I, I would like to be on the committee. Okay, so we have Tristy Wilson who is, strongly voices she wants to be on it even if somebody else does also um so is that okay with the rest of the board is there anyone else that says i need to be on this board this is my passion project <laughs> uh through the chair i don't need to be on it but I, it is something i'm definitely interested in but i don't need to be on it so if there's if there yeah if there's room but I, you know or not i think that would be three it sounds like trustee guyana mendoza also wants to be on it so I then, can't let you go out. That's all right. No, no, no. If you want to go for it, um, I just didn't want you to think you had to because no one else was going to uh, step. But no, that's fine. I'll give you the pleasure, <laughs> the honor. I'll, I'll give you the honor. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, if you change your mind, I will step out. Let me know. Thank so you. thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. All right, so we will have Trustee Shabo Mahin and Trustee Wilson join the task force. So thank you both for volunteering your time. And I'm sure Superintendent Sadari will be reaching out with details about the meeting and loop you all in. Oh, and that's the other thing. Normally subcommittees are around the board schedule. So you have to be flexible with your schedules because this is gonna, it's a short amount of time and they need to really get together and, and hash this out. So please don't make the task force wait for your schedule and just be flexible because we really need to get this underway. So that's the only last note to that. Okay. <laughs> yes, I, I, I know how that can work. And that's one of the reasons why I knew maybe it wasn't, uh, although I'm really interested in it. I know my schedule could be very complicated, which is why um, I, asked everyone else what they thought all right so the last thing is board communications does anyone have board communications through the chair yes um no formal anything that i'm working on but something that's just come up in this meeting and i'm wondering if we can talk about it at another meeting or something but i'm wondering about this uh zoom chat situation <laughs> and so i actually appreciate the chat but there's a part of it that feels um distracting if you will, and I'm wondering about, cause just like the constant comments from people, and I know I can close mine, but I'm wondering just from a legal perspective or even just like a um, accessibility perspective, how someone is saying, you know, you know how some people can see the comments, but not everybody can see the comments. And then there's some people who are making like multiple comments. Oh, you know, just, you know, and I'm wondering just, is there a way or if we should think about disabling chat so that people continue to speak the way you normally speak where you ask to speak, you get your formal time, uh, and then that's how you speak versus I'm going to speak and then I'm also going to go chat a hundred chats, messages. And mm. you know what I mean? I just, it feels yeah. interesting. To your point, um, I, I have already connected with Solomon on that. Um, just because there's just so many violations that can be occurring with unintentionally with the way that chat room is going. Um, 
I know that we can use the raising of the hands to indicate if someone wants to speak and that's the way we can like write down names and the chat doesn't necessarily have to be live. So Solomon, the director of technologies is gonna be looking on um, how to modify the settings to fit the meeting and what how it's supposed to be ran. And we're also gonna be checking with our lawyers to make sure we're not doing anything that we shouldn't be doing. Um, so we'll be checking with legal counsel and our IT director will also be looking at the settings to see where there is flexibility. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it up too, Ms. Solomon. Thank you. And, and yes. So um, again, a communication. So I just wanted to mention that the um, the city will be having a new uh, COVID testing. Mm -hmm. We'll have new COVID testing done this weekend, and we have been able to coordinate with them to create access for our essential staff members. So we have, I think, sixteen people that have signed up to um, take the test, and so I just wanted to express that that again, here's another opportunity that we've been working together. Yeah. Uh, Trustee Wilson, since we have some people on the line that could share with their communities, is there any criteria that needs to be met to be able to get tested or is it? No. Oh. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, well, I shouldn't say no. So you have to have Gmail and you have to have a phone. So, really? Yeah, because they have to get in touch with you and they send, what they do is that they send a text message with your results. So they have to have some place to send it. So that's the only criteria. You don't have to, you don't have any symptoms. You don't have to have any previous exposure or anything like that. Got it. Okay. So people do have to identify themselves and give. Yeah, that, yeah. there's a pre-registration done, and we have the um, flyers have been distributed, but the, um, it's called Project Baseline. And if you go on there, you pre-register and then um, they eventually, you can select the, um, the site and the time. Now, one of the things is that it does ask for insurance information, but you can skip that. You can just say no to insurance because that's what I did. I thought it was a little bit too invasive. It's like, you don't need all my policy number and all that kind of stuff. I just want to take the test. So I checked the no on that and it still went through. And I was able to get my test on Saturday, the past Saturday. It, you have, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't have anything to report, but I do want everyone to know out there, given the literacy conversation, it's something that we're going to be looking at closely. And it's not something we're walking away from. I just wanted to say that again. Um, our next regular board meeting will be June 11th, 2020. So mark your calendars and we will adjourn this meeting at 9.43 p.m. All right. Thank you. you all ladies and all to the public. Thank, thank you for joining us and have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Stay Bye, safe. Bye. 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 Bye.